<laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, would you want to try with the backup plate? Yeah. After we're done with this, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go back to that. Yeah. Mm. This is actually, that's, that's, uh, the yellow just means it's, uh, hasn't reported in a while. 3.4 mega is really high resistance, but, uh, I don't know what to just keep an eye on it. Yeah. So if you're tuning in again, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are here today at yeah. an unnamed geo in northeast of Kingman Reef. This is the expedition NA-149 for the Kingman and Palmyra Atolls. And we are here today at the bottom of the ocean with our ROV Hercules. And we are currently doing some engineering calibration tests. And our main goals for this expedition. Okay. Um, so you want to collect this one first and then deploy the other one? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Shift change. Nobody can find it. Uh, so yeah, as you can see here, many of our engineers and scientists are busy at work with our ROVs. And much of what we do here is very important to the larger scientific and engineering community. So for this dive, we have several science and exploration goals in mind. So this includes collecting samples for ground truthing the Ronald Spectrometer, a new instrument which is sponsored by Impossible Sensing and SETI Instruments. And we are also exploring selected regions of the summit and flank of the GEO. We are conducting surveys to characterize seamount biodiversity and collecting rock and sediment samples. And we will also be collecting other additional biological samples. And one in particular includes eDNA. This is environmental DNA that is floating around. And if we could take samples of that, we can understand the biodiversity of a specific spot in the water just by water alone. No need for other samples. Or at least the geochemistry of what's right below us. Yep. <clears throat> And so we are currently about 1,230 meters below the ocean. And we are expecting to be around 10 to 14 hours on the ocean floor. Can I see the arm in the, the bubble camera? And uh, we'll put this back in the starboard box, Sarah. So go sample salvo. And uh, just give me a second. Okay, box out. Out. I should do it.
Okay, close. That's, that's good. Oh, we can try our new pan and tilt light. Turn that on, see how it uh, how it does. We should have put it on the other side, actually, because it's always this arm here. Add stuff with, yeah. Oh, didn't seem to do much. So I'm not. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, yeah, great, great shot, uh, three pointer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna do yeah, three meters uh, plus minus as earlier. So okay, three meters. So I have a question. What is this instrument that we had dropped here on the floor? What is this purpose? Sorry, Daniel, were you talking to me? Uh, yes, whoever heard me. C can you repeat that? So what is it that we dropped here on the floor? What is this that we're uh, needing this for? Oh yeah, okay, so uh, this is a calibration target, right? So uh, with any new instrument, the first time you want to see how it works uh, in the real world, uh, in this case, the seafloor, uh, we need to verify that everything we measured and everything we, we thought we would see in the lab, uh, now we can see in the seafloor. So uh, the best way to do that, uh, because we're going to a new place where we don't know what the rocks are made of, uh, it's better to always bring your own rocks or your own samples, if you want, for the lab, that you know exactly what they're made of. So uh, when you shoot at them, like we're going to do now in the next few minutes, we, these are samples that we know exactly what they're going to look like in the instrument. We're going to fire the laser, we're going to see exactly what we expect, and we're going to eventually confirm that uh, you know, the instrument is working perfectly. Uh, it may take a few minutes, iterations, to adjust the parameters of the measurement, because the lab and the seafloor uh, look very different, as you can imagine. Uh, but we have ability to control a lot of things in this instrument, so uh, we'll be, uh, as you can see now, uh, hovering over now. Uh, these are larger targets than before, um, so it's going to be easier for the pilots to, to keep us on position so that we can perform this uh, fine-tuning of the instrument. Where did our gauge cameras go? And the, uh, I think they must have gone when I hit the salvo. Oh, okay, you know. do you want me to bring that one back? Well, the, so one issue is the gauges need to be up somewhere on the regular dive salvo, and I don't see them. And then also the camera for the for the instrument. Okay, I'll take it out of that. So I have another question for you, Pablo. Yep. Go ahead. So what are the green dots that we are seeing? Oh, the green dots. So these are oh, that's navi why I can't navigation see lasers. So yes. these lasers are used okay. by the pilots so to, just the, uh, to know the exactly instrument's camera up in one of these, they are. the deck camera, maybe. For us to no, or the uh, to measure camera. distance too, so those are 10 centimeters apart at all times. Yeah. So are you guys in sample salvo right now, or? This is the dive one. Okay. But the gauges is, is my yeah. fault, don't worry. So, so Daniel, this probably is the ROV that has the most, the largest number of lasers ever, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Between these two dots uh, and the two lasers that we have in our system, that makes four lasers. <laughs> so, um, Mike, which where would you like me to replace with PC2? Uh, you can put it on where that cabinet is. Okay.
So we had a question in the chat that asked, do we see much evidence of human impact on the ocean floor during the dives? So I'm going to ask Leela, uh, yeah. how much have we seen before? Yeah, um, it depends on where we're diving, but e uh, especially, for example, when we're in areas where there's fishing, like off the coast of the Pacific Northwest, off of Oregon, Washington, California, we've seen fishing line on the seafloor, and that can be really dangerous for the pilots. They have to make sure not to get caught up in that fishing line. Uh, we see sometimes evidence even of like bottom trawling in some areas. Um, we see just trash on the seafloor, uh, nets and stuff like that. Um, we've seen like old cans. We So you definitely see the influence of humans um, depending on, on how close you are to the coast, but really everywhere. And fine scale, there are also uh, has been some microplastics work done with samples from the Nautilus okay. before, and that there are, are tiny little plastics you can see in the sediment too. Oh, we have the gauges over there. Okay, that'll do. Yeah, I believe Nautilus did a research uh, project on that, didn't they, with the microplastics? Uh, one of the other science managers actually did her master's on microplastics. Yeah, yep. yep. thanks. Yep. So, as we are exploring oceans, we're also understanding human impact in many ways. And many researchers who come aboard our ship throughout our expeditions are here to study not only our life in geology and archaeology, including, but also just human impact. Whether that comes in the form of microplastics, uh, big barges of trash, or any other areas that might see human impacts. We have to go down there and understand where it is that life is flourishing, but also being at risk due to these areas of pollution. All right. So yeah, we're, we're almost on top of it. Uh, do, do you want, you want to uh, plug in our camera into the... It's there. He's oh, is there? Okay. Bottom okay. right. Yep. Perfect. Mm. We're a little high. Hmm. Yeah, 3.5. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, do you want lights, uh, Mike? Sure. Us? Yeah, let's see. Yes. Oh. Okay. That there you are. Oh, yeah. Turned on light to help see better. Turned on the light to help. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Kevin, is the laser still nominal? Everything's nominal. My favorite words to hear. I hear like the the Lego movie song, like everything is nominal. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, and the lights. Huh? Oh. Okay. Oh. The light is at ten percent. Yeah, 
I will till he's in and then shoot. Um, like there. <laughs> okay, yeah, oh. that's, pr that's pretty good. We're gonna shoot here, uh, Mike. Try yeah, to keep it in inside, the, inside the. Try to paint inside the borders. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the best you're gonna get, I think. Yeah. So far, so good. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we're gonna lose the exactly the red laser is gone, so we can do the science laser, but try to keep it there. You'll see the green laser there in a second. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, now it's outside a little. Yeah. So I each of the each okay. of these three squares that so you can see here are made of different material. Uh, and we're shooting almost in all of them. So we're going to get a data point that shows uh, almost everything, I will hope. Yeah, so uh, we see some peaks here uh, from the calibration target. I think Mike is doing a great job at keeping us on target, but we're, we're getting more more data points here. Uh, so <laughs> ho ho hold on, Mike. <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> You're staying on the plate. Awesome. That's uh, a computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a computer guided by the smart humans. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Taking multiple readings right now. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, yeah. You don't have to put currently all the time. You can put just, you know. Um, And so, so they're switching now to no background image and one, what is that, one one reading? One five seconds? Yeah, we're going to do five seconds. Uh, one five seconds. A little, little faster. Um, Want to try a bump ahead? Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, we're taking now uh, faster data and we're seeing uh, uh, peaks where they should be. Um, the signal is not as good as, uh, as we want it to be, uh, which is good. That means that we have margin to improve it. Uh, but overall, the peaks look that they're in the right position. Uh, and now the, the job is going to be to tweak the parameters to make them uh, shine brighter if you want to make them more intense um, uh, yeah.
Mike, uh, yeah, so we, we're going to keep doing this for for a while. Uh, okay, now we are halfway through our checklist. Okay. And yeah, just keep us keep us a three meters and as on spot as you can, okay? Okay. Sorry. Wrong way. So the wind and current is pretty high right now. Um, so once the wind and current goes down later, you might have a better shot with the smaller samples. Roger that, thanks. So for those of you who are new tuning in, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are here today out in the central Pacific Ocean in an area called the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And out here we are currently at the bottom of the ocean around 12,000, I mean sorry, 1,233 meters below the ocean surface. And down here we are currently doing some engineering tests aboard our ROV Hercules. And our ROV is going to be doing many surveys today that include surveys of geology and biology. And so one thing I'd like to talk about is how we got into this field. So for me, I started out as a geology major and I went on to be a United States Park Ranger. And from that experience, I became a science communication fellow here at the exploration vessel Nautilus. And this career path in science communication is something I am passionate about. Being able to talk to you from all around the world about the science that we are doing here aboard our ship. And there are many other career paths to getting into this program. And that includes things such as engineering, STEM, which includes math, science, technology, engineering, as well as art, so STEAM as well. We also have artists that come on our ship to help us with our outreach programs and to develop uh, materials for our education programs as well. So we need people of all talents and all backgrounds to come aboard our ship to do important work to help reach ocean science throughout the world. <laughs> so we have a question from the chat and asks what's one thing you hope to see on a C4 today 
So me personally, one of my favorite sea creatures is jellyfish. And I hope to see one just drifting by as we're doing some work and get, hopefully get one of our scientists aboard to identify it. And even if we don't know, we might be seeing a new species. So that's something spectacular we hope to see today. So we're going to answer some questions from the chat. So we have one that asks, is this a subduction zone or a hotspot? So that's a great question. So where we are is an area of the ocean that has many hotspots that seep up uh, these basaltic lavas. These basaltic lavas will eventually build up to create islands. And these islands can be over 10,000 feet high. This is where we get areas like the Hawaii archipelago. Over time, these islands can eventually erode down via erosion from wind and waves, and this can sink them beneath the ocean. This can start out as an atoll, a reef, and then it sinks down below to form a guillot, or a tabletop seamount. And this is what we are looking at right now. We're looking at the top of a guillot, and we've been sailing for quite a few days oh, yeah. to come upon this area. And we are looking at it in particular for nope. any signs of life that we might find unique in this area. And so we have another question that asks, have you seen any animals yet? So far we have. So we found an eel and our scientist aboard has identified it as a cutthroat eel. And we might find more of those as they swim by.
So for those of you who are tuning in, welcome aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus. We are currently in an area of the ocean called the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And we are about 1,233 meters below the ocean surface with our ROV Hercules. We are currently doing some engineering calibration tests to help with our later surveys. So we have some questions from the chat right now. Have you ever found a skeleton or anything on the seafloor? In fact, we have. Across many expeditions, we have find, found whale falls. Whale falls are very interesting because they are actually a way for us to understand the life cycle in, of nutrients throughout the ocean. So when a whale dies, it doesn't just disappear, it actually sinks to the ocean floor. Along the way, as it decomposes, there are many creatures that go in to feed upon it. We, that includes bacteria, amoebas, all order, other you sorts of organisms. Them? And once it gets to the bottom, we have other fish and crabs and other microorganisms that go at it. And this creates an entire ecosystem in and of itself just from a whale fall. So oftentimes when we explore the oceans, we look for these areas in particular to understand exactly how the ocean is recycling its nutrients. So I have a question Video. over here. Could you put our gauge camera on the on on maybe this Argus one for the moment, or one of these ones, just for a minute? We'll flip this off. Too hard for me to read over there. Can't uh, pick out the numbers. Yes, indeed. So Pablo, I have a question for you when you get a chance. Yeah, I can pick one. Yep. So we have a question from earlier. What wavelength is this sampling laser? Yeah, it's uh, it's two wavelengths. In fact, it's a uh, 532, uh, 532 nanometers. Uh, that's green. That's what you see green in the, in the picture. It also has a ultraviolet mode at uh, 356 uh, nanometers. So uh, green and ultraviolet. Thank you for that. Can we try to move the ship mm, five meters, like put it here? South, I guess, yeah, five meters south, see what that does. Did you want the Adelina in that, in that monitor six over there, or did it just fat finger me put it over there by accident? Was it sonar before? Do you have a preference?
That one over there should be sonar. But if I, do you want me to do this? Oops, I didn't mean to push. <laughs> I meant to ask. <laughs> oh boy. We'll need the, thank you. <laughs> like a toddler. I push this button. <laughs> I don't know how to do any of it either. Maybe now, let's try five meters due east. I'm trying to I'm trying to finesse this back here a little bit that's all, without like I don't move anything because we've got our camera like Herc is behind it so the camera's tilted like back like this and we can't see the gauges it's not like super important I don't want to interfere with what they're doing but. are uh, related to the mass of whatever element you're looking at. So, so I remember you explaining this a little bit on the on the social deck. So this is on the social deck on the Nautilus is where we all kind of go hang out, eat our meals. Uh, and I remember you explaining this a little bit before and now I'm like, wow. I mean, already I was wow, but this <laughs> is a whole different level. That's so awesome. Yeah, it's fun. But to like make these make these solutions. I have to go into the lab. We have a clean lab at URI. I go into the lab, I put on like my clean coat, I take off my shoes, I put on all my PPE, and I like feel like a sci I feel like a mad scientist with all of these, you know, acids I'm playing with. <laughs> well, thank you so much for explaining so much. I want to give you a little bit of a break because I feel like I have hit this side of the <laughs> control van so much between Dr. Kennedy and yourself. So I want to throw it over to the other side of the lab real quick, but let me double check with them before I do that. All right, so Paula. Hello. Hello, so uh, 
I don't remember. Did you get a chance to give an introduction earlier? Um, I don't think so, no. Ooh, okay. So, will you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing on board, and just kind of what your background is? Yeah, of course. So, hi everyone, I'm Paola, and <laughs> <laughs> um, right now I'm part of the science team. Specifically, I am the part of the data logging team. So, I am right now sharing that with Chris. Chris is the main data logger right now on the ship, and I'm kind of lurking around, seeing how things are done before my shift uh, from 8 to 12. Yeah, so that's 8 p.m. to 12 midnight, and again, 8 a.m. to 12, I don't know, 12 noon. Yes, exactly. <laughs> really looking forward to that. So will you tell us, uh, besides being a data logger, you have a lot of experience with corals, and I know uh, Dr. Kennedy over here was explaining about his research and his expertise on deep sea corals, but you're not deep sea. Will you tell us a little bit about what you do in your work with corals? Yeah, of course. So back home, I am from Puerto Rico, so I work in the Caribbean region, and I work with shallow water corals, which are a tiny bit different from deep sea corals in the sense that they depend on light to be able to create their food and survive. And so in the Caribbean, we, especially coming from an island, we greatly depend on these corals to hold off especially big swells that come from hurricanes. And they also host a lot of fish, and they're home to multiple ecosystems and organisms. It's really beautiful. But right now, with global warming and different other threats, we they are currently on decline. So what and I do back home... these are all the corals around Puerto Rico, or a specific species, or a specific area? Oh, well, that's a good question. Actually, right now, the main focus is around the sclerotarian corals. So those are hard corals. So specifically, the species are Acropora cervicornis and Acropora palmata. Wow. <laughs> I loved how you were able to rattle those off so quickly. And so those are not octocorals like uh, Dr. Kennedy was explaining. Like deep sea corals are octocorals and those are, or maybe they, no, because, um, so those are not octocorals. Oh, uh, those, no. Like they have a hard exoskeleton, very mm -hmm. different from octocorals. And the main difference is that in the deep sea, they don't depend on light. So they're basically very different from the ones that are shallow water, they greatly depend on their a little algae that lives inside them, and that creates food for them, and in return, the coral provides a safe haven for them to live on. So there's actual algae that the coral allows to go inside their body? Yeah, like, its taxonomy is ever-changing, so we really, like, it's called Susan Tail, and yes, it lives literally inside the polyp. Okay, and is that, um, does that algae, you said it does something for the coral. Yes, so the algae, it creates, like, same as a plant, it has photosynthesis. So it creates food for the coral and the coral polyp specifically. Mm -hmm. It's able to feed off of that so it doesn't have to uh, take out its polyps that often as deep sea coral do. Okay, because that was one of those things that uh, I've heard so many times in my life. Uh, that's during the daytime, they use their zoxanthalae to photosynthesize, and then at night they pull out the polyps. Is that true, or is that just an over-characterization of something, or an over-generalization? There we go. Well, with all honesty, I don't know the answer to that one, <laughs> but <laughs> it would make sense that during the night they might be able to get their polyps out and harness some food that obviously the photosynthesis of the algae will not be able to at that point. So does the algae, uh, besides providing food, the sugars for them, does the algae do anything else for the coral? Yes, it actually, I think most of the color that has the coral comes mm -hmm. from these algae that they host. So it's these algaes uh, are providing the color for the coral. Are they only green or are the algae coming in different colors? Yeah, they come. Like the two corals that I mentioned earlier, they're actually orange-ish when they're uh -huh. healthy. So, and that greatly comes from the photosynthesis that is happening and the biochemicals that are produced from the whole process. Interesting. Okay, so... When we hear about coral bleaching, is it the algae dies off? Or, because why does a coral, which is so beautiful and so full of color, all of a sudden it gets hot and warm and then it just becomes bleached? Yeah, it's a very sad process. So it usually, that usually happens when the coral is very stressed out. And one of the main reasons for that is usually global warming. The temperatures become too high in the ocean. And people think that it has to be like, 
uh, like almost evaporating and no only one or two degrees is more than enough for coral bleaching and the temperatures be too high so what it happens is that you have this coral and then this algae living on it and when it becomes distressed there is it's way too hot outside they actually expel that algae like out they don't want it anymore and oh so the same way that if i have been running a full marathon i want to expel my food <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that now they don't have them, their main producers of food with them. So they lose their color. They're still alive, but uh -huh. they start to lose off their color because the Susantel is not living with them anymore for the most part. So, how, okay, so you said that even if they have bleached, they're still alive. So how do, how do we know when a coral actually dies? Yeah, the, color, the coral actually dies when visually at least you can start seeing that instead of a really bright white you mm -hmm. start getting these off-white creamy colors and then at some point you start getting biofouling so a lot of algae and other types of species like sessile organisms start growing on top of it so that way you really do know that that coral is not alive anymore that's one of their main key points <laughs> to seeing so is there any way that uh would with what you're doing with coral farming, is there any way that we're trying to counteract all the coral bleaching or uh, like you were saying earlier with the hurricanes, is there something that you are trying to do with, with your research and your um, management team in Puerto Rico to try to counteract that? Yeah, actually, so global, like when the temperature rises, there, there's not so much we can do about that. <laughs> we don't control that, but uh, we try to mitigate once that the temperatures go back to normal we then with our coral nurseries once the corals are big enough around uh -huh. 15 centimeters we then take them out to the reef and put them there so that's one of our main components of coral planting and that way hopefully we do that in hurricane off season uh -huh. so they get a little bit of time to settle themselves in in the reef and yeah once they are there hopefully they will grow big enough and settle on the hard substrate before another type of thread comes in. Thank you so much for explaining so much about corals. And I'd love to hear more, but I wanna find out what's uh, what's going on. Is this a, with what Hercules is holding? Yeah, of course. I wanna know. So I wanna throw it down over to somebody on the ROV team, if possible. And I know y'all guys are working down there so busily. What exactly is Hercules holding?
Okay, so a uh, little update here from the spectroscopy team. So uh, for the last hour or so, uh, we've been quiet because we've been, we've been really uh, trying to fine tune uh, the performance of the system. We're trying to, to change the laser parameters, camera parameters, uh, everything that we can, uh, in fact. And the idea here is to really uh, try to learn uh, how the instrument uh, works uh, uh, in different conditions, with different rocks and different uh, distances from the from the bottom, so uh, we're not getting the results that we wanted, uh, as it is the case typically when you are trying things and pushing the limits. So we are doing a little bit of uh, going back to the basics, uh, troubleshooting, and we're uh, going back to essentially turning all the lights on, uh, seeing uh, how much we can see, uh, and and getting back to a point to a plane where we can actually uh, start seeing uh, signals again. The, one of the potential uh, issues that we have encountered here is that it's uh, too cold. Um, uh, we've been conservative when it comes to heating the system because uh, we, we rather play it cold than play it warm. Uh, when things get warm, typically things fry, electronics especially, uh, and the laser is pretty sensitive to temperature. So we, we're keeping things pretty cold in the, in the bottle uh, where we have things. It may be too cold <laughs> and that can create uh, misalignments and, and errors. And, we believe that uh, temperature is playing a trick uh, on us here. So we're trying a couple of things now um, to see if that is indeed the case. And, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep playing with this for a little while and, and have a little update for everybody uh, in a little bit. Thank you for the update. So it looks like as they are working on the Raman spectrometer. Um, we have our ROV intern, Ren, practicing his ROV skills. So hopefully we'll be cut it, or we might be getting some samples later, but it looks like right now we're gonna be, he's practicing some skills. And again, Nautilus is a teaching vessel. So we wanna make sure that we are giving students and people right at the start of their career and midway through their career opportunities to uh, get their foot in the door to learn the skills necessary for ocean exploration or ROVs or navigation. Next time that fun thing zooms by, if it does again, can we, can we look at it? <laughs> can you tell me what is that fun thing? I, that thing. I would love to know that too. <laughs> I can't tell if it's really close and smaller than I think, or like, is that just a thread? It's in behind the ROV arm. Oh, that's uh, tiny. Yeah, it's not off like in the distance like I thought. I think that's a <laughs> tentacle off a siphonophore that's gotten wrapped around the predator. Yeah, yeah. Oh. it does. Hey, Mike. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Can we go up to 10 meters, please? 10 meters. Right. Same position if you can, or yep. doesn't really matter, just 10 meters. Yeah, we should be able to come 10 meters straight up here. Up. Oh, can you come up on Ergus? I think 15 meter delta will typically be our goal. Yeah, you got it there and there.
Okay, looks good. Look, uh, look forward with your Argus camera. I want to see if you can keep Herc in the frame, but uh, show us the comps. Uh, not really. Oh, I just okay. zoomed in slightly to for you. You can check the other one. Just dump it forward for a minute. Just move, move the camera out of the way so we can see the other comp and then put it back. Other way, like look out. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, you can go back. Video watch change. Off come slightly. So I have a question for an engineer there on the line. Hello, everybody in SPL land. We're doing a shift change right now. So uh, the crew that was here from noon to four is switching out with the crew that's going to be here from four to eight. Boom. We got, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Here, other one. Boom. We've got the amazing Dan, who's going to be piloting the ROV Hercules, stepping up to the seat right now. <laughs> I'm already talking about you. <laughs> so for those of y'all joining us right now, we are over here just outside of the Marine National Monument, uh, diving around Palmyra Atoll. And we are diving just around a flat top uh, mountain or a guillo. It's pronounced weird, but it's spelled G-U-Y-O-T, Gio. <laughs> and so right now, uh, ROV Hercules is down there at 1,226 meters. And instead of having Argus with us today, Argus is still on board waiting for another dive. We have Atalanta. 
So Atalanta is another tow sled. Looks kind of like a mini Argus, just as powerful. And Atalanta was named after Atalanta from Jason and the Argonauts, the famous Greek myth. So as y'all guys might know, uh, Jason and the Argonauts is one of Dr. Ballard's favorite Greek myths. And Atalanta, y'all have probably heard of the story of the golden apple race. So Atalanta was the only female crew member who went aboard with Jason and the Argonauts. And during a very famous myth story from her, she was said she would never get married unless somebody could beat her in a foot, weight, foot race. So she actually had a suitor challenge her to a foot race and who had talked to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And Aphrodite had given him several golden apples. And as they were doing the foot race, every time Atalanta would get close, he would throw out a golden apple. And Atalanta, I guess, liked shiny things. So she would go running off to go catch the golden apple. And then she would catch it and start catching back up with her suitor. He would throw out another golden apple, so on and so on, until eventually he won the race and won her hand in marriage. So that's the most famous story of Atalanta, besides the one of Jason and the Argonauts. But so we have Atalanta in the water right now. Argus still on board. Test one, two. Am I on the line? Wow, I'm loud. So as we're all getting settled in, I'm going to totally toss Brian and Coralie a question. All right, all ready for it. So Brian, since this is your first watch, four to eight, will you tell us a little about you and what your role is here on the boat? Sure. So good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on your time zone. It's afternoon here on <laughs> Nautilus. Uh, I'm Brian Kennedy. I am the biological sciences lead for the expedition. Um, so I'm here representing the corals and other <laughs> biological life we'll see around on the seafloor. Um, I have a PhD in mer deep sea marine ecology. Um, and prior to getting that, I spent eight years with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, um, working extensively with the Okeanos Explor Explorer Program. Um, while I was there, I did a little bit of everything from running some sonars, driving the ship, um, working with the ROVs, uh, and then eventually got into some of the science and program management side of it. Coraline, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Corley Rodriguez, graduate student from the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. This is my third Nautilus cruise. Um, I was actually here uh, the last time we were in this study area, so I'm glad to be back. And I am representing the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We got corals and rocks represented. And one thing that I have to do a major shout out for Dr. Kennedy. Yesterday he came and he did an amazing ship to shore interaction. So if there's any teachers or parents out there listening, you can join us for a ship to shore interaction. And maybe you'll get Dr. Kennedy who blew me away with his knowledge of pretty much everything marine. <laughs> and Coralie, I love that you were here last year. You have the best cell phone footage I have ever seen <laughs> of the booby birds, which still crack me up thinking about it. 
So let's see. Chris, are you up for doing a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, if you want to just say what your role is here on the Nautilus and what your what your background is. So you're muted right now. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm a data logger here on the Nautilus. And uh, so I'm going to be recording any information that we pick up from the ROV. And what else do you want? That was perfect. And what else? Uh, what's your connection to Palmyra? Oh, I'm the I'm a station manager on Palmyra re uh, Atoll Research Station. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leela. Do you have a moment to introduce yourself? I know you were busy <laughs> typing away over there. I don't want to interrupt. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I'm Leela. I'm the science manager on this expedition. Uh, so I'm helping support the scientists that we have on board, including our lovely laser dive bot scientists who are sitting right next to me right now, and also uh, trying to, to patch in and coordinate with the scientists who are participating from shore. And I also help oversee, um, oversee the processing of all the samples that we collect uh, with ROV back up in the lab, and, uh, and then the data that then comes off of this dive related to the samples and, and the dive data. Um, help process that too with my team, including including Chris. That was awesome. Thank you. And I know you were steadily typing away, logging yeah, in all the yeah. data, showing everything. So thank you for uh, taking a moment to introduce. Uh, of Same course. with Brian, Corley, and Chris. So now I want to throw it over to the video side. And I know they're talking. Do y'all guys have a moment to introduce yourself? If not, no worries. Yeah, just do a little introduction, state why you're here, if you want to say what your background is. All right, video team already right here. Mm -hmm. So I'm Amber. I am one of the video leads and uh, senior video engineers. And with me, we have Daryl as well, our video intern. Hello, guys. Daryl, do you want to say what your role is here on board the Nautilus? I'm um, the video intern. I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now. <laughs> awesome. Get all the fancy buttons on my side. <laughs> there are so many. And I love that you pointed out that you're an intern here. So one of the big features of Nautilus is that we're an educational vessel. And we always want to make sure that we are allowing uh, the upcoming generation or the upcoming rising stars to get an opportunity to get their foot in the door, to gain the experience and the skills necessary for them to pursue further careers or just to learn more skills in general. So if I can throw it down to Lynette, do you have a moment to introduce yourself? Sure, hey everybody, I'm Lynette. I am one of the navigators here on Nautilus. So my job is to know where we are, where we're going and how to get there safely. And Lynette, can you tell us what's your connection to Palmyra? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly just because I know this answer. Uh, yeah, so um, I spent four months on Palmyra in the fall um, working as a uh, volunteer with the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, working on um, their rainforest realignment project. Um, so trying to get their rainforest more in line with the native habitat. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. So I want to throw it to our ROV team, but I know that they are working really hard. We never work really hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, so Dan, we just got an amazing comment calling you Delta Dan flying again, driving us through safety and danger and back. <laughs> Roger, I've been here for a uh, long well, now. Yeah. Five minutes and I've yet to touch any ROV controls, so. <laughs> but you're busy managing and directing. Um, no, I'm just kind of, uh, it's, uh, my co-pilot here, Ren, is his first time um, during operation, so he's had band training and all that stuff. But I was just going through a few of the uh, kind of different things that we have set up for this dive, in particular the, uh, the Raman camera that we're looking at now with the, uh, ooh, looks like the laser's lasering a hockey puck. Ooh. 
and uh, our gauges. And as you can see on the screen there in front of us, Ren's looking at the very exciting picture of a motor res, a term in a main. So he's burning those numbers into his mind so he'll tell if they change by a fraction of an inch. You got this, Ren. So, Ren, can we get you to introduce yourself if you are not too busy burning numbers into your brain? Sure, I have a second. Uh, hello. You'll have to um, put the mic kind of close to your mouth because. But you had a beautiful, smooth a jazz mask. kind of voice. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. Don't worry, the mask catch all, catches all of the saliva. Comms, Argus. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you, Ren. If you want to just say who you are, uh, what you're doing on board, and if you want to give us a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, my name is Ren Sakai. I'm a ROV intern here for the Ocean Exploration Trust. Uh, I'm coming from California Bay Area. I'm currently a master's student at Carnegie Mellon. I'm thrilled to be here. I've been sitting at a real live ROV for all of maybe two minutes, <laughs> trying to learn all the ropes. So thank you so much, Ren. I know y'all are busy just switching over. So thank you for introducing yourself. I'd love to throw it to the back row, but uh, to our two Raman spectrometer experts, but I know they are currently in the middle of something right now. So hopefully later on, but you've already been listening to their voice for quite a long time. Um, video, sorry, I didn't catch your name over there. We got Daryl over here. What's that? We got Daryl. Hello. Hello. I'm Daryl, I'm the video intern on the left. Oh, hi Daryl. Um, I didn't warn you, I usually do, but I adjusted some of the ROV lights. So the iris, you may have had it tweaked for looking at the porch with all the lights on. I turned a few of them off okay. and looked up a little bit. We'll go ahead and iris up for you. Uh, no, that's, I'll, I'll leave that up to the professionals, but I usually tell you guys, hey, I'm going to turn lights on or off, so you know. And I failed. Early on failure. So who's uh, who's running the show? What are we doing? Lasering? Yeah, we're currently troubleshooting laser. Uh, well, laser is functioning. Troubleshooting camera reading laser. Um, but basically, we've patched in the dive bot's camera to the bottom right screen there in front of you, mm -hmm. uh, next to the gauges. And and that's the calibration plate. We've been using the backup one because the, the calibration samples are five inches large and it was a little easier to to stay centered over. Uh, and right now we're staying at 10 meters trying to at least recover the water signal. All right, and should I have the laser hitting one of the targets? It looks like it's hitting uh, aluminum, ludibum. I think aluminium. that you're... How do you say that? Uh, the aluminium. Aluminium. aluminum. <laughs> I think you're all right right now. Roger. As soon as they're getting the readings they expect again, I think uh, then we'll Roger. try shooting it again. Standing by. So can one of y'all guys explain what exactly you're talking about with lasers, ramen, is that like noodles? <laughs> I'm throwing it open. Oh, not yeah. to them, not to them, not How to them, no. Like <laughs> so can you... Yes, uh, ramen spelled R-A-M-A-N. Uh, I can't dive into what that is as well <laughs> as Pablo could, but um, is the the spectrometer that we have mounted onto the vehicle right now, <clears throat> and uh, and we're basically collecting right now. This is the first time that it's ever been on an ROV, and uh, and it's been successful so far, which is amazing, and the team is really excited about that. Uh, so right now there are Raman spectrometers on the moon that this team also. Um, designed and and now under the water. Um, yeah, and if we look at the back uh, on the thing, it actually says NASA on it, right? Yes, it does on the on the testing on the thing on the the spectrometer itself and on the testing plate. Yep. So from the moon to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, and now you can see. So that's the laser right now firing at uh, a calibration plate. So that plate has samples of known um, composition, mm -hmm. and and what the spectrometer is doing 
is helping us to, to analyze the geochemistry uh, of what the laser fires at without having to actually collect a sample. And, um, and so first, there's a little bit of testing. OK, well, we know what this sample is on this plate. Uh, are we getting the measurements that we're expecting to get from that kind of a from that kind of a sample um, from the spectrometer? So that's what we're running through right now. Awesome. So it fires out that laser and it does it in very quick pulses, so not to do any damage, but to really get a very accurate reading. And so hopefully later on we're going to get some more samples, especially later on in the next couple of dives. Yeah, and part of what um, Pablo and Kevin are doing here is deciding you know, how many pulses. How many pulses, how fast, uh, from what altitude above the seafloor, um, with what settings should should they be firing um, to get the best readings? So that's all part of what we've got to do with this, the first time that this has ever ever been deployed in, in the sea. So this is truly like groundbreaking science in action, engineering, the engineering process that we're watching, where it's been tested, um, it's been tried out in the lab, and now we're doing our field test figuring out, troubleshooting what needs to change, altering it just slightly to make it more successful. And I wish y'all guys at home could see how hard um, the Raman spectrometer guys are working back here. Three yeah. laptops <laughs> set up. But it's so fascinating to watch this happening in real time. And then for y'all at home to be able to see these lasers firing, not right now, but just a moment ago. And again, this is being used on the moon, now at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, and that was a huge, a huge win for them, uh, you know, even having it get successful readings as we were descending. Um, and, and Pablo mentioned, you know, it's because of the five plus years of, of testing, of engineering and then testing in the lab uh, until it was really ready to actually be taken into the field that, that they are having success on this very first um, trial. Yeah, so a long time from, I guess, even just the idea of having a, a, a Raman spectrometer being able to be mobile and not just a, in a set lab to field testing it out. Long process. And so satisfying, so worth it. Mm. The really fun thing about these type of <coughs> relatively non-invasive um, sensors is you can, in theory, cover large amounts of area, sample lots and lots of different substrates, rocks, and whatever without having to actually disturb the seafloor and bring anything back to the lab. So it allows us to do basically no disturbance sampling over larger amounts of area and go straight from, you know, seeing something in situ in the water to having the, an the scientific answer without a whole lot of extra work of having to pull the samples up, dry them, package them, ship them, get them back to a lab, prepare them for doing this in a lab setting. And so it really increases the pace and scope and efficiency of exploration when we have these kind of advanced in situ samples, uh, samplers available. So I like what you said that this is something that we've, we've used before in a laboratory setting, just we're making it so much more efficient by taking it out here, yeah, by absolutely. taking it into the field itself. So Brian, thank you for that explanation, and, and same to you, Leela. Um, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about some of the corals or some of the biodiversity that we might be seeing out here? Maybe not right now, but hopefully later on during this expedition. Sure, so <clears throat> this area is um, has a really interesting kind of deep sea community. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about the corals, because frankly, that's what I'm most familiar with. But yes, there's a whole 100%. host of different things out here. Um, and so the corals around here, what you're going to see at this depth is predominantly octocorals. And they're close relatives of the corals you see in shallow waters, um, but there's a couple of big differences. One is they have a proteinaceous skeleton, they have, um, made out of proteins for the most part. Um, whereas when you think about their shallow water kind of coral reefs that you may have seen snorkeling or scuba diving, a lot of those have a, a calcium carbonate aragonite um, skeleton. Um, and the shallow water corals, for the vast majority of them, actually have a symbiotic relationship with a, an algae that lives inside of them and photosynthesizes and provides sugar to their hosts. Here in the deep sea, where there's no naturally occurring light, um, these corals are completely dependent on what they eat or what they can catch to eat for their energy. Um, so from an ecology standpoint, it's a really very different community, whereas coral reefs are primary producers in the shallows, 
Um, and down here, it's a purely consumption heterotrophic would be the more scientific term for it, um, environment where they have to eat all of their food. And that carbon gets fixed or produced in, a, in the shallows. And so we have photosynthesis in, from phytoplankton up in the shallow waters. Uh, and that carbon that gets the energy that gets trapped in those kind of complex carbon molecules in the shallows have to sink all the way down here nearly two miles under the water before they get eaten. So um, they're eating a lot of uh, detritus, a lot of dead stuff, like you said, the, the yep. plankton that are coming down. So it's not living plankton for the most part. It depends on the depth. Um, sometimes you will get some, there is living planktonic organisms down here, but a lot of it is what we generally type call marine snow, which is dead um, animals, waste products from other animals and things like that that uh, sink down to this depth, which um, provide the energy for most of the uh, c ecosystems that we find down here. And I'm glad that you defined what marine snow is, because I feel like that's one of those things that everybody throws out there, and yet when you ask somebody, what actually is marine snow, so many times they don't know the answer. Yep, it's just pretty much everything floating down that's small. So we're, you're hoping to find some octocoral species down here, some deep sea corals. And have we, I know we've been here several times in the past. Have we found any really interesting corals or corals that maybe haven't been seen before? Yeah, absolutely. So the, there's been 32 previous dives, uh, deep submerged dives in the greater Palmyra Kingman um, exclusive economic zone of the United States. But nearly all of them were done uh, about 200 miles south of here, um, right around Kingman and Palmyra. So the a group of seamounts we're focusing on on this expedition, where we are of just shy of 200 miles north of Kingman, have never been explored before. So this little cluster of seamounts is the first time anyone's been down here with um, an ROV or a big camera system to document the, these kind of communities. So what we're interested in, um, I'm more of an ecologist, so I'm interested in why organisms live where they live. Um, so I'm kind of curious at what depths we see different transitions in communities, uh, the comparisons between here and the Line Islands versus the Phoenix Islands about a thousand miles west of here, which I've done a lot of work in, and the Hawaiian Island chain, uh, which is about a thousand miles north of here. So trying to understand how um, what organisms prefer to live here versus in those two islands and kind of where the transition points are that move uh, for these communities as we change from one island group to another across, you know, vast reaches of deep sea that still has seamounts of different sizes that can serve as stepping stones or waypoints in between these different island chains. So we're right now in part of the line island chain. So we don't know, uh, or we're still trying to figure out a lot of uh, what's down here. Is there a particular reason why we're trying to figure out so much about this ecosystem? So I, I guess my question is, why are we exploring down here? Like, is there a reason for it, or is it exploring just to explore? Yeah, there's a couple different like, scales on that. One is, if you actually think about the United States, the United States covers more ocean area than it does land area. And so we know very, very little about the 11 million square kilometers of the United States that is underwater. So in some ways, this is very just Lewis and Clark. We, after the Louisiana Purchase was made, uh, Lewis and Clark got sent west to truly document what the new United States included. Uh, and we're doing a lot of that same effort here broadly with um, Ocean, Exploration, uh, Ocean Exploration Trust and Nautilus, uh, as well as other vessels like the Okeanos Explorer, are really just trying to make a baseline characterization of the area um, to understand what is submerged America. This expedition and these areas here um, have a particular focus right now um, because it's an area under consideration for inclusion in a n U.S. National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and so the data we're collecting here is super important to be fed right into um, a federal decision-making process on how best to manage uh, and conserve and utilize um, these deep reaches in the remote Pacific so changing subject just a little bit, but can you tell me how did you become such an expert on this? I know a lot of viewers online want to know, like, what is your career path to get to be an expert on on these remote Pacific corals down here? I have had an unusual career track, but I would say just about every marine scientist has had an unusual career track. There isn't a very clear cut path. Um, so I wanted to be a marine biologist since I was as long as I can remember. Uh, little kid, um, I announced when I was like five I wanted to be a marine biologist and kind of never looked back. Um, 
but after after graduating undergrad, um, I joined the NOAA Corps, which is the eighth and smallest uniform service of the U.S. federal government, uh, and they operate the NOAA's research vessels and research aircraft. And so I spent a couple years um, actually driving ships, and I was lucky enough to be assigned to the Okeanos Explorer. Uh, and from that, I kind of fell in love with ocean exploration and started learning as much as I could about all the different roles uh, and positions on the ship, from working the ROVs, running the sonars, um, and then I kind of graduated up into managing some of the programs and projects. Uh, and then I realized I was kind of driving a little bit too much of a desk and wanted to get back to the science. And so I left that and started working on my PhD in marine ecology. And I love that you got kind of your start. I mean, you've had so much diversity in your career path, but you were talking about the NOAA course. So last year on the um, mapping expedition to Papahanaumokuakea, we had two more uh, NOAA Corps members out there. And I had, did not know very much about NOAA Corps at all. So so... Um, just eye-opening to hear how much NOAA Corps did, especially in my backyard, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it's just one of those things that I feel like so many times you don't hear about them, but they are so integral in everything that we do in ocean exploration, from um, mapping to the buoys, just so many different facets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the NOAA research fleet is responsible for doing the majority of the nautical chart making um, and keeping the nautical charts up to date. They operate research um, vessels who do general, general purpose research um, all across the globe, um, a dedicated ocean exploration platform in the Okeanos Explorer, um, as well as running the fishery survey vessels that are responsible for collecting the data that helps set the fishery management council's uh, quotas and stuff. So all aspects of NOAA science um, get fed through the NOAA Corps, and then you take the aviation side that helps calibrate satellites and does disaster response um, imaging. After a hurricane comes through, they fly through and uh, collect aerial images within, you know, within literally 10 hours of a hurricane leaving an area, they're already out flying, collecting damage assessments on how best to respond to the emergencies, to flying hurricane hunters that fly into the center of hurricanes to collect data to better understand how to um, model and predict the movement and behavior of hurricanes. And for somebody from the Gulf who is impacted by hurricanes and has ridden out a couple of them, we're very thankful for that information. So that way we can plan or see when a hurricane's coming, predict where it's going to go. So thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy, for explaining so much. I want to throw it over to Corley. Can you tell us a little bit about your career path? Because I know you uh, have been out here to Palmyra and on the Nautilus. I think this is your fourth expedition? My third, yeah. Your third, OK. Will you tell us a little bit about the different expeditions that you've come out on and a little bit about the career path that's led you here? Yeah, so uh, my first expedition was in 2021. I think that was NA-135, and it was to what we call the Chautauqua Seamounts. There is one seamount. It's kind of off the coast of Hawaii, comparatively compared to the Line Islands. Um, and one of them is called Chautauqua, and then the rest are all unnamed seamounts, but to make it easy, we just call them all the <laughs> Chautauqua seamounts. Um, so I first went there, uh, and that was con kind of conducting my own research project, which was really fun. Um, I got to learn a bunch of different sampling techniques. It was my first time doing trace metal water sampling. What which is, is that? Oh, yeah. sorry, you're about to explain, but <laughs> tell me more. What is some trace water trace water sampling? Yeah, trace metal water sampling. So you have your basic water sampling techniques, but when you're looking for these things that we call trace metals, which are these metals that are really, really low abundance on Earth, so think cobalt, manganese, um, iron, things like that, uh, you have to have special techniques that you use to keep the whole area clean to promote uh, to prevent any contamination. So being trying to do that on Nautilus was really interesting. Um, and that was over in the Chautauqua Seamounts. Did mm -hmm. I say that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the next cruise I went on was to Palmyra Atoll, Kingman Reef. Um, I think that was NA 137, um, and. That was just kind of adding, I have this collection of rocks back at uh, Rhode Island that I'm using for my research project. So it was kind of just looking for rocks to add to that collection. Um, we're so this whole expedition, <laughs> all 29 days at sea, solely to add to the rock collection. 
Um, quick update from back row. Yes. Uh, okay, so so there, the readings weren't were no longer looking uh, as optimal as they were earlier, and so the team back here was doing a little bit of troubleshooting, and the working hypothesis right now is that um, earlier the laser was around six or so degrees Celsius, um, which is within its working temperature range, but now uh, it's around four, 4.5. Um, and so it's, so it's gotten colder over time because the ambient temperature down here is around 3.9 right now. Uh, and in the lab, they'd noticed that in colder and warmer temperatures that had an influence on the laser alignment um, and, and therefore then also on the, on, uh, the, the laser's ability to operate properly and give good readings. So um, Pablo is right now talking to his team and, uh, and trying to decide how to move forward, but um, we may be choosing to recover early, uh, but would be taking a rock sample before doing that so that we can use that for ground truthing uh, with the laser on, on deck. So, so stand by, but that's what's going on right now. Thank you for that update. Yeah. Yep. And that's super fun mm. for me to hear another rock sample. I know, I was going to say, throw it right back. <laughs> Add that rock to the rock collection. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing. Yeah, we may decide to then survey around here uh, before recovering. So, so survey Instead. around to find out uh, the different rocks? Or uh, rocks, just bio, well, yeah, whatever we can. So that'll be a, a decision between um, at least the dive bot part between, between Pablo and his team. And then what we do with the rest of the dive will be up to uh, PIs and... Dwight. All right. Well, my hope is that we can uh, check out some cool biodiversity, get Corley a couple of rocks to add to her rock collection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, um, so when you previously came out here, you came out to add rocks to the rock collections, mm -hmm. trace, trace mineral water sampling. Trace metal water sampling. Trace metal water sampling. And so how do you how did you do that? You took water from the bottom of the seafloor. Yeah, so Herc is equipped to with six Niskin bottles, um, and it's pretty cool the way it works. So once we start uh, sampling, this cruise will be sampling for eDNA, um, but you'll see they just pull a lever, and um, when the Herc goes down, there's two open sides of the canister, and so there's water flowing through it at all times. And then when you pull the lever, it'll... Um, kind of, there's a, I don't know the right terminology, but it'll snap mm -hmm. these two, like, top and bottom into place, so you capture the water at that point in time. And uh, we take it back up here. We, uh, then you get the water out of the Niskin bottles, bring it back into the lab, and you can filter it. I think that was a beautiful description of a Niskin bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, a tube that has stuff on either end that snaps and collects water. Yes. <laughs> You know, that's, it sounds better when you say it like that. <laughs> no, but I loved it. I was able to, like, I was visualizing it perfectly in my brain with, like, little minerals floating around. <laughs> so what are, your, what are you trying to figure out from this expedition? This expedition is actually really interesting because I'm not collecting any samples of my own. I'm actually just along for the ride. Um, the rocks that we're mostly going to be looking at down here, I... And that's what I study. I study ferromanganese crust. I specifically study the causes and enrichment, the causes of formation and enrichment of these rocks. Um, I'm also interested in the paleoceanography or the potential for use as paleoceanographic tracer. Um, so what is paleoceanography? Like what the ocean looked like when dinosaurs were walking around? Essentially, yeah. So paleoceanography is this branch of geological oceanography that is concerned with how the ocean changed um, through t throughout time. So like how you would think of paleo paleontol paleology, mm -hmm. paleontology, you are looking at rock records on land generally. You can look at rock records in the water. And these also tell us a lot about earth oxygen. Um, this is how we know that the earth's uh, interglacial glacial cycle uh, which is pretty interesting, but uh, these rocks form over millions and millions of years. Uh, I think on average we say they grow about one to 10 millimeters per million years. So that's incredibly slow growing. And yeah. on geologic, 
even on geologic time periods, that's very, very slow. Um, so, uh, so we're going to be looking at almost like a sedimentary kind of process on top of them, but just so slow moving. Exactly. So, ferromanganese crust specifically are this like ferromanganese rock that grows on top of seamounts. So first and ferro you have is meaning iron, iron because Fn is iron on the periodic table. Yes. Um, so you have like the seamount that becomes erupted generally from some volcanic process. And then we don't know exactly when they start to grow ferromanganese crust, but maybe immediately afterwards, most likely not, but eventually sometime after uh, it's erupted and becomes a seamount, then you'll start to have this growth of ferromanganese crust. Um, and these rocks are pretty cool because they're really enriched in a lot of things other rocks that we look at aren't enriched in. So I talked about those trace metals. These rocks are incredibly enriched in these trace metals. And it's kind of fun for me and my advisor. My advisor is a mantle geochemist. Mm -hmm. So she studies more on of the igneous side of things. When she looks at, when we look back at the data of how enriched these rocks are, she's just like, this is crazy. <laughs> it's enriched in all this stuff that I don't ever see. So it's pretty fun. So with this new technology, with the Raman spectrometer coming online, this would make your job so much easier where you could possibly just send down the ROV Hercules or another ROV, get so much uh, data coming back so quickly, just like Dr. Kennedy was saying, where it's just going to expedite everything. And then that way you sadly don't have to come back anymore. You can <laughs> stay, in, stay in your apartment in Boston and get all kinds of samples and data coming back. I, in theory, yes, that would happen. But I do like working in the lab. Um, how we figure out uh, abundances in these rocks is we do laser ablation or laser ablation ICPMS, solution ICPMS. Um, I really enjoy doing solution ICPMS because that's when I get to feel the most like a Can scientist. Can you explain? Okay, sorry. I heard letters right there yes. that make sounds, but solution something something. Yeah, ICPMS, which stands for inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. So. <laughs> Okay, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so essentially, you have a, you can either do it by laser, but I mostly do it by solution right now. And so you get a solution, you powder your rock down into a solution, powder your rock down, you put a bunch of acid on it, you create a solution, you take that solution to the instrument, the instrument picks up the solution, it goes through a sp spray chamber, it kind of makes it, turns it into a gas, it uses plasma, which is like this a huge amount of energy. It's pretty much like a little tiny sun that they make in the instrument. And with that energy, it shoots your solution. And then at the end of the instrument, there's all of these notes that your solution will hit depending on what mass it is. So you'll get different counts at uh, different, different places. And those counts... I was thinking siphonophore, but it's like also so small. It's like a thread. So were we able to see the whole siphonophore earlier? I didn't see I it. I didn't see it. Okay. And then can y'all guys, uh, or somebody, explain what a siphonophore is for those at home? Oh, I know it's like a uh, battle of rock, uh, paper, scissors. Who's going to do yeah, it? Yeah, it's related. It's a different group, but sort of related to jellies. And uh, they have, uh, it's colonial, and or sorry, not colonial. They have, yes, colonial. And they have this um, part of their body, there's their bells that are in the front called are they Brian nectophores, nectosomes? I always mess up what those I think are called. It's nectoso nectosomes. nectosomes. <laughs> um, and those are the part of their body that that they use for jet propulsion. Um, and there's yeah. four main aspects, right? One for jet propulsion, one for feeding, feeding reproduction, reproduction, and then I always forget what the fourth one yeah, is. Yeah, I'm I'm having trouble remembering oh, no. the fourth two: reproduction, feeding, Locomotion. jet propulsion, <laughs> and a, yeah, blinking on and mystery. On, Something. Whatever the fourth, uh, and so they're clo or the one of the most is. Uh, recognizable siphonophores is going to be the Portuguese man o' war. Yep, the one that is the bane of my existence in the summertime going to the beach. Oh yeah, you have a lot of those down there. Yeah. 
But they're so pretty though. They uh, they have those little air filled sacks and they float along. They look uh, really cool. They look their, pretty. They look beautiful. Ooh, the purple. Yeah. All the purples, those deep blues. And then you touch one. Yeah, so the Portuguese man of wars, and I'm sure all siphonophores have stinging cells, uh, the nematocyst. And so if you touch them, it fires, it triggers it, and it gets you get stung. Now, luckily with the Portuguese man of wars, and definitely not the case for all siphonophores, it's usually pretty, it stings, but it's not too bad. Feels more like um, a whole bunch of little bee stings. And then after a couple of minutes, it usually goes away. Now, one of the things that definitely drives me nuts is we have this beautiful thing that washes up in the Gulf uh, every spring, and it's called a blue sea dragon. And it looks absolutely gorgeous. And so we have so many people who go up and they touch these beautiful blue sea dragons and definitely not a good idea. They eat the siphonophores, the Portuguese man o' wars. And so all those nematophysists go onto or go into uh, the blue sea dragon and then they are extremely uh, painful when you touch them. In fact, there's even a really funny TikTok video about dumb ways to die with a person holding up an entire handful of them. So if y'all guys are just joining us from at home, uh, we are about, we launched around one o'clock and it's now around 4.30 or five o'clock. Oh my gosh, it's almost dinner time. So we are about four hours into the very first dive of the expedition, Expedition NA-149. So we are at an unknown, unnamed geo, just northeast of Kingman Reef. So we are right outside of the remote Pacific National Monument. And we are testing out a brand new piece of equipment uh, that is on Hercules right now, and that's the Raman spectrometer. And so one of the aspects of Leland, this dive... back there? Any scientists back there? Uh, yes. Pilot? <laughs> no scientists? No scientists. What do you want? Uh, they What's are currently pilot? in the middle of something. But we have several of them. Tell them I'm going to trip a Niskin for engineering tests, see if that gets their attention. <laughs> All right. So uh, Dan's about to trip a Niskin bottle for an engineering test. So if y'all were listening earlier, a Niskin bottle, thanks to a beautiful description from Corley, is essentially like a clear tube. And when you pull that out, see the tube is open. And the, as you pull that lever, like Dan, our ROV pilot, Hercules pilot is doing, it'll capture a whole bunch of water in that tube. And then we can bring that tube up to the surface for a variety of tests, whether it's eDNA, chemical analysis, like Corley was saying earlier, trace metals, uh, analysis. Later on, we're hoping to grab a whole, and not on this dive, but hopefully we'll be grabbing a whole bunch of eDNA or environmental DNA. Hey, Dan. Pilot. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I think we're, we're done testing this. Uh, I think we have a temperature uh, too cold issue uh, for us here after being four hours down here. So we want to call it an end to the test uh, uh, before we... Well, I guess the next steps 
is going to be to pick up the the plate that you see there, the cal target, right uh, store it there, and then we're going to collect some samples. Uh, we'll like samples of the sand uh, that we shoot at earlier before. Uh, if we can at least, I don't know how, if you can collect that somehow. Oh yeah, I can collect And, some. and some of the rocks that are uh, there in the crust. Uh, Roger. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. What's that? Back row, if you're listening, um, I don't know what our ballast situation is, so I'm going to do a few tests myself here before we attempt any uh, sample collection. Sounds good. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, zero the Z bias and see what happens. And uh, Click off all these crazy autos and uh, yeah. Hey, Adam. Roger. Thank you. on too. I'll turn a few lights off here for you. <coughs> so again, for y'all guys, we are on the first dive of the expedition about four hours in, and we are diving on an unnamed guillot. So a guillot um, is a flat-topped sea mount, essentially, or a tabletop mountain. And what they do is they start off as like a little island and then over time, they start getting weathered away until eventually they form an atoll. Um, and Palmyra Atoll is a beautiful illustration of a classic atoll. And then eventually they sink below the water due to, again, weathering and erosion. And then they become a guillot. So the way that you spell it is, for those who wants to, to want to do a Google search, G-U-Y-O-T, so guillot, or just tabletop mountain. So we are down around 1,200 meters. And if you th see that thing on the sand, that's actually uh, one of our calibration metrics for the Raman spectrometer. So with the Raman spectrometer, uh, you can find them in lab settings, but this is the very first time one has been at the bottom of the seafloor and attached to an ROV. So groundbreaking science taking place that will hopefully expedite uh, so many chemical tests. So what the Raman spectrometer will do, will essentially shoot out a laser. So if you were watching earlier, it looked like a little green pulsing laser. And it will do an analysis by vibrating uh, the, mar the molecules and tell us exactly what is going on in there, what, what is the chemical composition of it, what's the minerals, and several other key things that me as not a geologist can't go into too much explanation of but that is the calibration tool that you see right there and so if you missed Pablo's explanation earlier what he was saying is the laser is a little cold right now which is just one of those things that happens when you're testing out new science new technology oh and there's a little fish So right now what's going on in the control van is that there is an active discussion between the Raman spectrometer team, uh, the lead scientist, and the scientist on watch about what is going to be our next step. Are we going to go around and do a 
sediment core? Are we going to do some Niskin bottles? Are we going to survey the biodiversity, possibly take back some rocks? Ooh. So a little bit of background information about uh, where we are. We are in just outside the remote Pacific Island National Marine or Marine National Monument. Uh, we are doing a baseline or one of several things. We're doing a baseline of what's out here, biodiversity, species, possibly finding some new species out here, or possibly just uh, working on the taxonomy along with testing out a new piece of equipment, the Raman spectrometer that I was talking about just earlier. And so Palmyra Atoll is that classic atoll that we see. There is actually a research station on board and it is owned by two agencies, which is US Fish and Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy. ROV pilot Dan. So again, just a little bit of background information about Palmyra Atoll. Um, just because we are right outside of it, no, we are not on Palmyra Island uh, or Palmyra Atoll, however you want to call it. So Palmyra uh, Atoll is one of the Northern Line Islands and it's located about just south of the Hawaiian Islands, about 1,000 uh, miles. And so from North America, it's about 3,300 miles in kilometers. I think that's 5,300 kilometers. And one fun fact is the atoll is almost the approximate center of the Pacific Ocean. So use that the next time you go out to trivia night. And it does have land out there, uh, but it's only about 12 squared kilometers. Uh, for the area, 4.6 square miles and about 9 miles or 14 kilometers of actual coastline.
So Palmyra is currently the largest marine protected area. Oh. And if you can see on the satellite feeds at home, uh, ROV pilot Dan is putting back the spectrometer calibration tool into ROV Hercules's basket, bucket. Hey, uh, Kerry, sorry. Yes, I, go, you, yeah, 100%. Hey, Dan, beautiful shot there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, because we have sponsors from different agencies and uh, since we're here, before we start getting samples, and now that you know we still have the laser, everything is on, uh, we're going to do a little bit of a photo shoot, uh, photo ops. And what I would like is to have the Atalanta um, uh, position itself uh, behind uh, Hercules. Uh, uh, go up a little bit, maybe go up three, four meters, then uh, up four meters and Atalanta behind, and try to capture with the camera of the Atalanta the laser shooting. Um, into the into the ground uh, from different angles. Um. Roger that. Sorry, are you say left or say right? Say left. Yeah, Roger. I'll just uh, move her instead of moving the boat. Mm -hmm. Um, can you look up a little with your camera? Uh, that's good for now. Hold what you, hold what yeah, you got. So, uh, I think the laser is fine. The green one. Yes, I do. Yeah, get it ready for one. Thought you all should. Uh, Okay. Um, Lynette, you can zoom out there for us on Atlanta, please. Okay, tilt up a bit more. Okay, so uh, when you guys, I think it seems like you're, you're in position there, Atlanta, Atlanta. Yeah, getting there. Right there. Okay, let me know when Sorry, it's there. Sorry, Cable, so we I can't talk to you directly. Oh. Okay, I, di I didn't hear the last thing you said. Oh, no, this is good. And uh, and uh, Dan, is there a way you guys can dim the lights or turn them off? Yeah, let us play around with it for gotcha. a minute here. Gotcha, waypoint two. Oh, yeah, so laser is firing, as you can see. Uh, yeah, stand by. And, and if...